So let me uh, welcome you and welcome Dr. Joseph Featherstone and all of the attendees, um, distinguished educators from near and far, students, faculty, friends, families, teachers, colleagues, trustees, um, welcome to our lecture. The Ch Child Development Institute's annual Longfellow Lecture honors the memory of Cynthia Longfellow, Sarah Lawrence class of 72, who devoted her professional life to improving the lives of young children. And it wouldn't be possible, and I note this every year, without the family and friends of Cynthia Longfellow, so thank you. Today's Longfellow lecture is particularly special because it inaugurates an important conference. Faces of Progressive Education in the 21st Century, Infancy Through College. This conference is in honor of Sarah Lawrence College's long history of innovative education, the Early Childhood Center's 75th anniversary, and the, ch yeah. ECC, let's hear it. And the Child Development Institute's 25th anniversary. <laughs> Sarah Lawrence College, as many of you know, was founded in 1926 as a laboratory for testing John Dewey's ideas about <laughs> teaching and learning. Dewey believed education should be engaging, inquiry-based, focused on individuals' interests and lifelong development, and foster connection to communities dedicated to the betterment of society. Since its inception, the college has adopted these philosophies. At Sarah Lawrence, we believe that learning takes place best when the interests and capacities of the individual student are the starting point. Capacity, John Dewey wrote, may denote mere receptivity, like the capacity of a court measure. But another meaning of the word capacity is an ability, a power. I've always loved that idea. At Sarah Lawrence, we provide the conditions for active, engaged learning rather than passive consumption. This philosophy instills a lifelong desire to learn, reflect, and think creatively. As an extension of Sarah Lawrence College's pedagogy, CDI and the ECC missions are built on the perspective of the child as an individual in the social context and education is broadly conceived as an opportunity for nurturing humanistic social values, emotional, imaginative, and intellectual development. In light of the current national dialogue on what the purposes of early childhood, public school, and higher education should be, it's a critical time for all of us to come together, as we are today, and engage in a conversation about what meaningful education is in the 21st century. As Dr. Featherstone wrote in 2005, the quality of children's lives and the relationships between kids and grown-ups ought to be central concerns of educational policy, yet they scarcely appeal in all the stacks of current standards. Progressives demand a more personalized and communal vision of education a social and emotional as well as academic apprenticeship to growing up. His words still ring true eight years later. We're honored that Dr. Featherstone is here to share his thoughts on how we as a larger community can address the challenges and seize the opportunities facing progressive education and move forward and provide an individualized yet community-based experiential and relevant education for all children and all students. I'd like to ask Indira Blackworth, director of our CDI, to introduce Dr. Featherstone. Thanks for being here. Thank you, President Lawrence. It is wonderful to see you all here today embodying the kind of talented, diverse, and dedicated community John Dewey envisioned as critical to transforming society. It is a tremendous honor to introduce Dr. Joseph Featherstone as we come together to celebrate, reflect on, and discuss 
progressive education practice over the next few days, it is fitting to first acknowledge the outstanding contributions made to the field by educator and activist Dr. Joseph Featherstone. Cited by Education Week as one of the 100 most influential educators of the 20th century, Dr. Featherstone continues to inspire generations here in the US and abroad through his writing and teaching on democratic education. Dr. Featherstone, an educational and cultural historian influenced by Dewey, has articulated the significance and relevance of progressive education at each juncture in time over the past half century. As he has so eloquently written, progressive tradition offers today's rising generation of teachers and parents the adventure of the big idea that an education suited to children's nature is possible, that classrooms for everybody's children can provide opportunities for intelligent conversation and reflection on experiences that matter, and that such reflection is childhood's best preparation for both life and citizenship. Dr. Featherstone is one of the country's foremost advocates for all children having a high quality education, and that actively engages them as individuals with unique interests, learning styles, and strengths. And for all teachers having the time and space in their classrooms to know each of their students and to create an environment ripe for learning that reflects the diverse needs and interests of their students. He is also a devoted practitioner of progressive pedagogies. He taught at Harvard and Brown Universities and was faculty leader at Michigan State University's school-based teacher education program. He served as principal of the Commonwealth School in Boston for many years, he wrote about education, politics, and literature as an editor of the New Republic. His series on British primary schools appeared in the late 1960s in the New Republic and played a significant role in class reform at that time. His numerous writings since then have and continue to influence educational thought and democracy and the strong inseparable ties between them. He is also well known as a poet. Given what we know about how children learn and effective teaching practices, we must ask how our children are faring in the current era of standardized and oversimplified curriculums, depersonalization, and disengaged classrooms. It is clear that it is all the more crucial for communities to mobilize in a renewed mission, following a path Dewey and Featherstone have paved to ensure all children have both rights and access to a lifetime of meaningful education. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Dr. Joseph Featherstone. Well, thanks very much. Can everybody hear me? If I start to fade out, Raise your hand and I'll uh, boom out a little bit more. Uh, the Cynthia Longfellow Lecture honors an alumna of Sarah Lawrence, who was herself a teacher, which is, I think, also a good first step for a lecture series. Um, my one connection I have with Sarah Lawrence today is that my daughter Miranda is a graduate student here in the Child Development Program, whose uh, anniversary we're honoring. Uh, I was thinking about the two dates. If you subtract 75 from now, my math is never very good. But if you subtract 75, uh, you get the 30s, the late 30s for one institution. And if you uh, subtract 25 from today, you get the 1980s for another. And it's interesting, uh, just as a start on this, I, uh, I won't be able to say very much about higher education. I'm going to leave that uh, to the conference itself. But the question of progressive values in higher education is really interesting to me. Um, and uh, Sarah Lawrence, of course, is an appropriate place to talk about this because it has such a rich history as a progressive place founded to give women and now men too an education that would combine the best of Oxford and Cambridge tutorials with the vision of John Dewey's 
democratic progressivism. Um, uh, Debbie Meyer, who is the um, Johnny Appleseed of, <laughs> of, of uh, progressive schools uh, around at least the East Coast, um, has said um, that the ideal school would combine uh, kindergarten and graduate school because those are the two places in American education where students get significant choices. Uh, and in between, in between, things are a little shaky. Um, um, this is also a place notable for the arts. Uh, as a poet, I very much admire the work of Marie Howe, who teaches uh, on this faculty, and also for a tradition of social activism. Um, you know, giving a talk like this is an occasion where you can embarrass your friends and your family. Um, and, you know, with impunity, uh, at least while you're up here. Um, and uh, and I, I said uh, before the speech that I wanted to mention Ann Cook, who's an alumna, uh, the founder of the Urban Academy, along with Herb Mack, her husband, a terrific New York City progressive public school. Uh, uh, Anne Cook is also a leading critic of high stakes testing who has done more than just grouse about it. Uh, she's uh, put forth um, really quite thoughtful alternatives, visions of collaborative learning. And if you go to the website of the Urban Academy, uh, you'll see some of the implications of that work. Not that everybody has, not that it has swept um, the field. Um, <laughs> While writing this talk, I must confess I faced a spiritual crisis. I read a piece that a woman wrote in the New York Times who loves the preschool her daughter is attending, the progressive preschool her daughter is attending, but wonders whether this kind of education is really of value to children who face the Darwinian rigors of late capitalism. Maybe children today, she says, would be better off with less Rosa Parks and more Scrooge McDuck. <laughs> um, was she right? I wavered for a moment. But, but you can see that I've recovered. <laughs> um, I, I have three points today that I want to make. Um, one is a very you know, big sounding word. I know words like democracy and things like that need to be dipped in acid and cleaned off, uh, especially after going to war to save democracy in the Middle East. It has a kind of ugly taste to it, doesn't it? Yeah. But still, uh, I would dip it in acid, clean it up, um, and say that the roots of progressive education, for me, lie in the movements for democracy and human rights around the world in the last 200 years. I would argue that progressive classrooms are at work on the implications of democracy for kids and how, and full of um, work that shows us uh, how we and society might actually respect children. I mean, in a way, everyone respects children in some abstract way. But actually um, send the signal to an individual child of respect uh, takes real skill and takes the kind of work uh, that we're celebrating today and exploring in the rest of this conference. So that's one point I want to make. The next is, uh, I thought a lot about current policy issues and you know, uh, I was going to talk about uh, the preschool controversies over uh, kindergarten preschool, universal preschool. Uh, I was also thinking about immigrant schools and how progressive values have a lot to say, and indeed progressive examples from the past have a lot to say uh, about what we should be doing uh, with immigrant communities and rural communities and schools. All these current issues, of course, we would talk about um, measurement and assessment and testing uh, and all that. Uh, and and uh, I thought actually the people who were here uh, today know a lot about those issues, just as with higher education, uh, 
folks in higher education know about the crevices and little crannies of progressive uh, practice and values in higher education. So I thought I would be more useful to the conference today as the voice of the past. Um, and I wanted to do a little tableau of progressive figures. I talk a little bit about uh, three figures um, who, who I think in some ways are archetypes of progressive uh, democracy and its dilemmas in education. Um, and then uh, I want to say how uh, the work and the values that these kinds of figures have been doing um, uh, extend up to the present. And indeed, my interest in the past is not the past. Um, I don't know, I'm getting so old I can't remember who knows what references <laughs> at what age. Um, but um, but uh, how many of you in this room have heard of John Holt? Oh my goodness, that's a lot. It's not even all old timers, although they tend to be uh, in the cluster. Um, John Holt uh, used to say that a conservative is someone who worships a dead radical. <laughs> um, and I think he had a point. Uh, there is often in progressive uh, meetings and gatherings like this, kind of nostalgia uh, for the old days. And I don't mean these examples uh, in that light at all. Um, my point is just that there's a certain um, set of values and conversations uh, that recur in the in our movement, uh, which reflect, I think, the wider movements for democracy uh, across the planet. And uh, so we should know that. Partly it's a question of not living in the United States of amnesia. And partly it's a question of using the past as a resource for our work in the present. <coughs> and partly it's to see dilemmas that these figures face. Because as John Holt perhaps was implying, uh, they are not answers. Uh, the progressives in the past, and indeed the progressive sites right now around the country, small but real as they are, uh, are not solutions uh, to the problems of education. They're sites where people work in really promising ways on the dilemmas of education and democracy. So they're places where people get to struggle on better terms with often intractable dilemmas of teaching and learning, and also the t teaching children of poverty and oppression. Um, so I don't come here uh, announcing answers, uh, but I do come here saying that we progressives have a lot to learn from the past, and I want to emphasize that today, and I hope again with a few things about the present. But I'm Again, thinking that the conference itself um, has some work to do uh, and uh, that you folks are well equipped to speak about the present. Um, one reason why I'm uh, interested in the three figures in the past um, is that uh, for some time now, um, I've been working on an oral history project uh, for the North Dakota Study Group. The North Dakota Study Group, as some of you may know and others not, is a national, despite its funny name, a, a, a national um, progressive group. Uh, it has its origins in the era of the Civil Rights Movement and the 60s uh, mutinies uh, against the system, and also the 60s revival of progressive education, 60s and 70s and early 80s revival of, of progressive education. Um, and it occurred to us, we had a 40th anniversary, uh, and it occurred to us that this outfit of community <laughs> activists, teachers, um, organizers, uh, some uh, university people, 
it occurred to us that um, some of us were getting kind of long in the tooth, um, and we should probably uh, do something about reporting and practice. But we also didn't want, uh, in the spirit of John Hope's warning, we didn't want to be uh, just concentrate on the old timers. So we started to do uh, interviews with a whole range of the ages of the people. There are young teachers there, and then there are some you know, people like me. Uh, and uh, uh, so that's what we've been doing. When I say we, most of the really good interviews have been done by uh, a really wonderful law historian named Arthur Tobier. Is, is Arthur here today? He's a terrific uh, oral historian. He does amazing, uh, profound interviews, really. And we have these interviews gathering. We're not sure how to use them. Probably we'll do some kind of work. But also, three of them are up on the North Dakota Study Group's website. Um, and you can look at them. Uh, one of them is Joe Sweena, who's a Hopi Indian activist who was a longtime member of the group. Uh, one of them is Marv Hoffman, uh, who was the founder of the Kenwood uh, School in Chicago, which is an African-American, uh, wonderful, progressive school in Chicago. And his, Marv is now running a, a, a progressive teacher ed program in Chicago. Uh, his roots are in the civil rights movement. And uh, the other, the third person I'm going to talk about, Alice Zaletsky, uh, who's a teacher at Central Park East, which is one of uh, Debbie Meyer's schools in New York City in East Harlem. Um, the first figure, though, I'm going to mention uh, is not in our archives. It's my grandmother, actually. Mary Trainer was a teaching principal in Pennsylvania coal country. She was the first woman in Pennsylvania to serve on the state Democratic Committee and an activist in many causes, including labor unions and the battle against child labor. My Aunt Mary, who was named for her, had her in fourth grade and said she was as tough as nails. Um, Mary had to show how she washed up and brushed her teeth, and also each child to finish fourth grade had to pick a poem by the 19th century English poet Robert Browning, Robert Browning, <laughs> memorize and recite it, and say briefly in her own words what the poem meant. I can tell you, I never met this woman, but I know a lot about her uh, from my mother and Mary. Uh, my grandmother is not our picture of a child-centered progressive <laughs> in any way. She was a tyrant at home, and I believe a tyrant at school. But two progressive notes in her practice ring true. The concern for the whole child, children's health and hygiene, which was such an important theme uh, in the, that generation of progressives. My Aunt Mary was in her class in the 1920s uh, in Northeastern Pennsylvania. And uh, the other, interesting thing, which always puzzled me, and I wish I could have interviewed her, was her ambition for a child to take an active part in a high-quality poem, reciting and explaining. I thought Browning may be an unfortunate choice for fourth grade <laughs> curriculum. You know, we're so much smarter these days uh, about what children can do and not do, uh, right? And uh, so I asked my Aunt Mary, and she said that the poem that she memorized was called Pippa Passes, which is actually a poem I know. And it's about a little girl in poverty uh, in England uh, who delights in how beautiful the spring morning is. Uh, and she, you know, teaching for understanding had taken place. Um, the other underlying thing about this woman is her example and her vision. My aunt, a fourth grader, <clears throat> also grew up to be a local activist in politics. Mary Preferis, it was said, could make the difference for a national candidate 
in a close election in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. She connected her mother's teaching to political action. School and politics were two vehicles to advance working people toward full participation in health, in culture, and in political power. Two more figures will help me round out uh, this tableau. This one might be surprising. W.E.B. Du Bois, the great African-American activist, taught Summers in a one-room schoolhouse in rural Tennessee in the, 19, in the 1880s, picking flowers with the kids, giving spelling tests, and rewriting classical Latin texts so that sharecroppers' kids could read and understand them. Texts like Cicero, and again, a modern progressive looks askant at this. His favorite student, Josie, had a deep hunger for learning and came alive in school. It's a wonderful portrait of this child. When Du Bois returned on a visit 10 years later, he learned that Josie, who had dropped out to help her family, was now dead. Her cares had worn her down. In the essay, it is amazing book, The Souls of Black Folk, which came out in 1903, uh, just about the time of the Dewey School. Du Bois makes Josie a symbol for generations of color, children of color, shot down like birds as they were opening their wings. The essay about Jody, Josie has a title, a very bitter title. It's called Of the Meaning of Progress. Um, a third figure, Alice Seletsky, a New York City school teacher, interviewed by my colleague, Arthur Tobier. The wonderful interview is on the website, as I said, of the North Dakota Study Group. Seletsky is a veteran teacher in the 1960s, and she ends up teaching at Central Park East with Deborah Meyer and others in, in an amazing staff. Alice recounts how she used successive opportunities of the time workshops by famous figures of that time, like the indomitable Lillian Weber uh, and Pat Carini, who I know a lot of people in this room have some connection with, um, and Pat Carini's famous prospect school summer sessions for teachers on child study and the like. The child study stuff really comes out strongly in the Seletsky interview. To develop a sophisticated child-centered classroom where kids performed and were documented in a hundred ways. I visited her classroom and was blown away by the depth and quality of the children's writing in their own voices about things that really mattered. They were real writers. Seletsky shows a teacher inhabiting a pro progressive professional milieu she would want for many teachers. She had access to cultural and pedagogical development it's so clear that the interview is kind of jubilant that the, the world was her apple and she took big bites of it as a progressive with that kind of support. Um, it's really very moving. She marks the, the, the kind of a high level, mark of a high level professionalism we all want for teachers. Selensky, unlike our other two, does not think of herself as particularly political. I think the word progressive is too big, she says. She prefers the phrase child-centered. I don't like big ideas. I'm not Albert Camus, she says. Uh, anyway, um, the strength of the schools that Debbie Meyer has founded and inspired, uh, not just in her own circle uh, of schools like CPE and Mission Hill, the pilot school in Boston, which uh, a, a number of you know about, I think. Uh, and I believe there are Mission Hill folks coming to this conference. I don't know. Has any of them gotten here yet? They're probably uh, on their way from Boston. Um, anyway, um, one of the successes that Debbie Meyer uh, has given us a model of a vision for 
is uh, staff of the school as an ongoing um, conversation and discussion about how to promote and further the work of the school. Uh, and that's a very important thing that not even all progressive schools in many times have had uh, that kind of community among the adults as they talk about the kind of community they're building uh, for, for the children. Uh, so the examples inspire us, I think, but they also shake up our categories and make them less tidy. What does progressive mean? Uh, what does democratic mean? Uh, my grandmother looks to me like what I call a hybrid progressive. Someone who blends standard teaching repertoire with a few important, even memorable, democratic touches. There's also the activism outside of school she shares with Du Bois. They were both organizers and troublemakers. Du Bois, as a young New England snob, was reshaped by the people of color he went out to meet. In every decade for 200 years, teachers have gone out to teach and meet the people and some of them have been changed in the process by a true human and spiritual exchange. This is one of the great true romance possibilities of progressive education. You're a young educated person and it's possible if you stick with teaching that the children of the people will change you. Du Bois did not stay in school teaching. He was a Teach for America uh, graduate. <laughs> <laughs> but the Souls of Black Folk is a great progressive document that testifies to the capacities and intelligence and culture of oppressed peoples and the hope for educated professionals to be able by hard work and self-reflection and very much effort to transcend the blinkers of privilege and class. In opening himself to the music of what he called the soul songs, Du Bois found a metaphor for the dialogue of middle class teachers who try to go out to meet the people. Du Bois argues in the souls of black folk something more and bigger than his own small experience. He argues that the purpose of education is to produce whole men and women who are ready for full participation and this is a memorable phrase, full participation in work, culture, and liberty. Which I think is the root, in some ways, the root complicated goal of progressive education. Um, it's, a, it's phrased in such a way that it covers a high school, college, uh, and everything. But the emphasis is on participation uh, and full participation in these different realms that in a way draw on different, uh, different values and activities. But Josie also taught Du Bois that schools alone are not enough to save the Josies of the world. There had to be social change too. Du Bois spent a life in radical social activism and in fact died in Ghana the day before the great 1963 March on Washington led by Martin Luther King. The vast crowd of people assembled on the mall to fight racism and Jim Crow were in effect, as one speaker said, Du Bois' spiritual grandchildren. Josie haunts Du Bois, and she should haunt all of us. The Josies are all the kids that we are losing. How shall men measure progress where dark-faced Josie lies? We ask the same question today. Martin Luther King was one of Du Bois' grandchildren, but the, and the Civil Rights Movement was in part a children's and an education crusade, yet its great leader died wondering not just about schools, but how to build a society built on persons, not profit. And famously, King warned us in the, in the amazing Riverside um, speech that he gave, about the Vietnam War. He warned us prophetically against militarism, racism, and materialism. He had gone beyond schools a 
although he was also still talking about schools. So if, if you see these figures in the tableau, you can start to add figures of your own that you know from now, and you can work backwards if you want, or you can, if you're historically minded, you can work upwards uh, <coughs> to them from the past. Uh, I would, in a full, uh, you know, panorama, we need a movie, I think. Um, in a full panorama, I'd have parents who have a progressive practice of parenting. I would add educational professionals of all sort, the great librarians and social workers uh, and psychologists who work with kids. I would add, of course, teachers like Alice Soletsky, but I would also add the activists like my mother uh, and Du Bois, who might not have been the most outstanding progressive classroom people. They surely weren't. Uh, but whose practice uh, took up the framework for the lives of children in our society. Uh, the, uh, the other thing to say is that there's uh, a bit of a, over the years, the 200 or so years of progressive um, practice, there's a um, kind of, I don't know what the word is, spectrum or um, lineup that goes from uh, uh, social radicals who are moving on the bigger social issues of the day uh, to classroom teachers. Sometimes they're both, but sometimes uh, there are different people are, are performing a different function. I mean, if you uh, it used to be in the days of, uh, in, the, in 1938, uh, when uh, some stirrings were happening on the Sarah Lawrence campus. In 1938, some uh, of those folks would have, might have argued, they did because they founded an education institution, but there were people arguing then, as there are now, um, that, that, um, that social activism has to uh, preempt work in the schools. My reading of this history uh, and our history as a country <coughs> is that there, you know, one form of uh, activity doesn't preempt or substitute for another. But actually, um, when in progressive seasons and high tides and places where uh, democracy makes advances in the country, usually the advances uh, go hand in hand. I mean, for instance, the 1930s were a hugely active time for progressives, uh, especially in the cities. Uh, and if you look at um, Larry Cuban's book, How Teachers Taught, you'll see that in New York City, Denver, Kansas City, and a whole host of places in the 30s, there was really quite a vital um, you know, teacher thing happening in public schools as well as private. And of course it was the era too of the eight year study, uh, which was a classic study of progressive public and private high schools. Uh, they got uh, colleges and universities to exempt them from the graduation, the uh, admission standards of the day in order that they be freed up to do progressive curriculum work, which they defined in terms of democratic, uh, democracy actually. And as you may, some of you may know, uh, the, um, the, uh, the graduates of these uh, progressive public and private high schools did better in college uh, than people from conventional uh, private and public schools. And uh, not only that, but in a piece of valiant research, two scholars have uh, teased out the fact that the uh, progressives from the most radically progressive uh, high schools, public and private, did way better. The other thing that is of interest to us in an age of intense measurement of ourselves and others uh, is the way that the eight-year study folks um, 
tested and assessed. Mm -hmm. they were, they're a model to us in a way of how not to run from assessment, but to try and assess what we really value and to document it and establish uh, that our values are in fact being enacted. Uh, the behavior study is, I think, a really uh, terrific <coughs> example of that. And they had measures of, for instance, long-term measures, which I, I want to, a point I want to return to in a minute. They had long-term measures of what people in later life uh, did by way of reading books, taking part in uh, citizenship activities, um, and attending and uh, being responsive to cultural events and, and culture. And uh, that seems to be you know, all part of the, of the 1930s and the ways in which um, you know, the, the radicalism of the day and the people who were, as Alice Zaletsky is, not, you know, not Albert Camus, uh, <laughs> People like that uh, were also part of a whole movement that was happening. There's no question that the Alice Sletskys of the world benefit from the activism of the activists and the organizers and the, tro the big troublemakers, um, just as another generation of progressives benefited mightily uh, from the civil rights movement um, and its work. But it, it does, um, well, that's enough on those three. There, there are uh, pieces of a longer and broader story, of course. It's not just about schools, but uh, about the lives of generations of men and women and children and the institutions that oppress them and raise them up in hope. It gives us perspective today to remember that often the world's democratic revolutions first, first touched children's lives as matters of family practice and parenting. The interaction between schooling, formal schooling, and what's happening <coughs> with parents and uh, children is a very interesting thing. And I don't think it's necessarily the case that progressive schools precede um, changes in families, although that's a point that the social historians would argue. I would argue that there's been a long, slow, halting spread of a more egalitarian family practice around the world. And this shift, uneven as it is, is also the ground of progressive education. Around the planet today, women and children whose fates are always intertwined are increasingly stepping into the light of new recognition as persons in their own right, as citizens, people with agency and voice and minds of their own. Take a look at a new documentary, Girl Rising. It's, it's just come out, um, and I think it, it'll be around. It's, uh, it's young women in Haiti, Nepal, and Indonesia to see one of the great stories of our time unfolding, little girls with eyes wide open, stepping for the first time in their life over the threshold of a classroom. Huckleberry Finn leads to Hush Puppy in Beasts of the Southern Wild. Uh, these child studies, which are also the property not just of parents or uh, educators in schools, but of course the property of poets and novelists and filmmakers around the world. These are child studies too, and part of the child study tradition that I know is very strong in this institution today. Uh, they are portraits, all these portraits in fiction are portraits of unique children uh, who are unique and uniquely portrayed in a way that was not the case, at least in previous eras of, of European and American history, whatever else the world story is. They're unique children 
whose presence and voice, of course, like Huckleberry Finn and Hush Puppy, expose the society and its sins. Huckleberry Finn is a book about slavery and the moral conscience uh, of slavery that opens <coughs> in Huckleberry Finn himself. Uh, Hush Puppy, less so, but it's a tale <coughs> of the environmental degradation taking place on the Louisiana coast, um, and also the way that poor people uh, are throughout the country, but not in, only in New Orleans, uh, not only in Detroit. Uh, poor families uh, everywhere are being uh, subject to natural disasters, but also a kind of American version of ethnic cleansing. In every generation for the last 200 years, there have been progressive activists and classroom teachers working to make democracy happen, to meet and accept children as citizens of the present. Citizens of the present is a phrase that Carlina Rinaldi of Reggio Emilia uses, and it's a wonderful, complicated thing. I, I won't stay to uh, elaborate on it, but uh, if you think about it, it opens up a lot of things about time, about citizenship, um, about where, um, where and in what ways children can be thought of usefully in even preschool children as citizens. The fights, the battles today over inequality and access are not new. Um, the fights over assessment and racist and anti-democratic policies in education are not new. But some progressive teachers have worked in each generation on developing the necessary skills for children, but also have developed a more complete and complex democratic package. They knew that the real basic skills for the next generation are not only literacy, but the capacities and habits of mind and heart that it will take to move the US and other nations toward more democracy. <clears throat> the, um, the reason why I like Du Bois's formulation of participation in work, culture, and liberty is that it frames the issue in the right terms. The, the next generation will be citizens not only citizens of the present, but citizens of the future, and as they grow older, citizens of the past. Um, and they'll have, or ought to have, a say in deciding the shape of the next economy, not just fitting in or being certified as okay or superfluous. <laughs> of particular interest to me in this story today are the hybrids like my grandmother. She goes marching on in current activism, of course, where she would be very much at home. But she would find sisters in classrooms, too. The most common form of democratic education, or shall we say progressive education, taking place today is not in the wonderful and significant sites like Mission Hill, or the Brooklyn New School, or Muscoda, or Ella Clark, or the Urban Academy, or the Cambridge Community Charter School, which are all uh, you know, terrific progressive schools and sites where people have the room and the support to practice day-to-day -day democracy. But the most common form of democratic practice is rather the teachers like my grandmother who add ambitious democratic elements within the constraints of their situation, their time and place in their own school, the library they work in, or the clinic where they practice. Progressives today need to ally with hybrids and other teachers in regular schools and other professionals with a stake in childhood. We have critical interests in common, and I believe those interests are more important than what we have not in common. All teachers and professionals need to join with others 
in fighting the influence in policy of, of the 1%, defending professionalism, union and voting rights, defending public education, stressing and enacting a need for more economic democracy. Such issues, as I say, are bigger than the issues of progressives versus mainstream styles, styles of teaching. There is a need today for coalitions and allies. Um, teachers unions and communities in some parts of the country are uniting. I'm thinking of the example of the Chicago Teachers Union. You might be surprised if you have a dim view of teachers unions, and indeed, some of them have not shown in recent decades, uh, or even in some of the past decades. Um, but you might be surprised and interested if you looked at the website of the Chicago Teachers Union at their manifesto. Um, and the other thing which is probably not so evident from the website is the way that they have reached out to communities in Chicago in the struggles there that are now taking place there. Uh, I think they might be an example of some reworked version of teacher unions and professionalism, uh, at, especially in urban, urban schools. I think my last point, uh, since I've talked quite a long time now, uh, has to be uh, something about uh, who you would add in the tableau. Uh, people in the conference in the next while uh, might want to think about that and, and who, who you would put in place. Um, the, uh, for sure, the scholars and teachers who are promoting one or another uh, variety of child study uh, would be in the picture, right? Um, the scattered work in higher education would go in the picture. Um, of course, teachers, of course, activists. Um, I don't know what um, would unite such disparate work in disparate levels and, and disparate places. It's not the same, of course. Um, something, you know, te you could say teaching is teaching, but it's not, I mean, it is really different at different levels and in different, and in different places. Um, the, uh, we might learn something about what we should be aiming for as hybrids or as people who get a lot of support for democratic values. We might become clearer about that if we look more at complex learning and what it meant at these different levels. By complex learning, I mean uh, teaching uh, and learning in settings where a community is created and there are connections between listening and under understanding are the habits of mind and heart that make a child more resilient or more curious. Um, the, uh, the complexity of progressive learning is something that I would urge us to think about more and also to study more. Uh, I mean the link between uh, if you used an older language, the 19th and early 20th century, if you used a language that talked about the link between uh, head and heart, uh, head and heart and hand, uh, and nowadays we would have more psychological categories for that kind of work. But we would be talking, I think, about some uh, settings in which uh, what is normally called or not normally, what is sometimes called the informal or hidden curriculum of schools is actually part of the uh, main event taking place. Um, I think a, a wonderful example of this, uh, for those of you who have been seeing it, is, uh, well, I think um, from August to June was shown on this campus. Is that right? Okay, so some of you have seen that. 
there's also the series, this is Amy, Amy and Tom Valens are two filmmakers who did the August to June film about a California public school. They're now filming at Mission Hill in Boston, the Boston Pilot School, public school. And how many of you have seen any of the clips on, about that? You can go online and see uh, now, I think, four or five segments of their filming. It's not the movie they're making. They're making a whole, I think, uh, you know, a movie with a lot more, uh, it's a lot more together. This is clips of the stuff that they've been filming that are edited for an online audience. And various groups now are looking at it. I would strongly recommend uh, that you look at that and that te te uh, the teachers here and especially, but also uh, university people uh, might be interested in showing it. Uh, and I think what they're heading toward uh, in the clips I've seen so far is a little bit captured by a quote from Jerome Brunner, the very distinguished psychologist. Consequently, I conceive of schools and preschools as serving a renewed function within our changing societies. This entails building school cultures that operate as mutual communities of learners, involved jointly in solving problems, with all contributing to the process of educating one another. I think this is, uh, Werner uh, isn't exactly succinct, but, um, but he gets us to this business about uh, democratic learning as doable but complex Progressive schools as places where in a face-to-face -face human environment, teachers and students study and learn complex practices, working together, thinking together, disagreeing, empathy, nonviolence, creativity. I think those are all aspects of what, um, of, the, of the bigger picture. Um, and now I am going to race to a conclusion, because I have taken your time, too much of your time. Um, and I think, um, the quote from Mission Hill that I like is, Ayla Gavin's the principal saying um, two things. One is there are a lot of teachers who respect children, but not all schools have a structure of respect in place that allows the whole school to work on respecting children. And the second quote is that um, I'm using my um, voice here. And I'm losing my quote too. To understand that kids have to feel and see their own smartness, to open up space for the brilliance children bring. Um, and now I'm going to come back to Mary Trainer and W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, now more than ever, I think we need to link the smaller work in particular schools, which is so crucial to fresh possibilities in politics and national life. The struggle against the policies shaped for the 1% is the framing issue of our times. Schools cannot do this work alone, they never could, but work in schools can contribute. People in this room today 
will write the next chapter in the history of democratic education. And now I'm going to end, since I'm a poet, I would feel like ending with a poem. Um, the North Dakota Study Group, which I am a part of and is a national progressive group, uh, that's where we're doing these interviews that I told you about, um, is having joint meetings in Detroit this year and next with activists and educators in Detroit, especially at the Boggs Center, presided over by Grace Lee Boggs, an old revolutionary who's in her 90s, actually. Um, and uh, is a strong and hopeful presence in a city that needs strong and hopeful presences. Um, this is so, they're opening a school, the Bog Center School, and uh, I wrote this poem from, it's called Possibility. If you think about the conditions in Detroit, uh, there are little Detroits all over the country now. Um, and no set of national policies uh, is actually framed uh, to do much about it. Uh, upstate New York, um, uh, many of our cities are places where there isn't actually a program uh, for what might happen to those economies and those families. Uh, so I think that, and Detroit, of course, is in some ways uh, a kind of a rock bottom case um, for America at the present moment. Not everywhere, of course, is Detroit. There are many more hopeful places, but because they're working in Detroit, uh, I feel their, um, their work has a symbolic importance. It's making a way where there is no way uh, in a very moving way. But I'm sure there have been in the history that I've just alluded to in this talk so far, there are lots of progressive educators who've lived through very dark and hard times. Our times are not as bad, I think, as the times that educators and children and families live through in the Great Depression, for example. We come close, closer than America has come ever since the 1930s, uh, but still, uh, in general, not as dark. In places like Detroit, however, uh, the outlook is extremely bleak, and the idea that these folks are starting a school is terribly moving as teachers. Possibility for Grace Lee Boggs, Julia Putnam, and the staff planning the Boggs Center in Detroit. The south window looks out on raised beds, bean vines. Inside, the teacher understands how to praise the moments in a young girl's life. She connects her to books and the lives that lit up Seneca Falls, Selma, Stonewall, and now Detroit. The old visitor, a poet, thinks of words bought and sold like slaves. He attends the pleasing buzz of freedom, the give and take when a child asks the rest of the class, where do words go after we say them? In the classroom that feels strangely like home, he takes in the having of ideas, whispers and laughs from kids high in the mind's jungle gym. Children are imagining in different languages and accents, mapping paths to reason and wonder, pushing on the hard door to the republic of learning. The visitor is almost afraid to see long-buried promises coming to life, children starting to grow to the full height. A grave third grader stands intent, studying a soap bubble, two dark eyes reflected in the rain.
rainbow surface. Thanks very much. tired of talking to you. Talk to me. Uh, yes. Some of the most radical movement is all over. We don't. It, it's, it's kind of uncomfortable for us because it's it's out dispersed. Is the homeschooling and people who are dropping out that they feel that schools are so regimented, stifling, and repressive that uh, they want nothing to do with them. They mm -hmm. won't let their kids go to them anymore. And this is this is part of where the the seeds of of change may or may not occur. And it's part of it. This has been the de-schooling as it has been. It's been whole too. Right. And the, the, what do you, this, do you think, I don't, my, I, my feeling is it's not, um, it may, it, it causes problems for really creating, uh, organize, organizing to create a democratic society. Right. In terms of that. But anyway, I'm, go ahead. Let me promise. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, the, the, the comment is, uh, if, just because I think some of you are back, uh, may not have heard it. Uh, about uh, the, the p people who mistrust schools to the extent that they're homeschooling uh, and don't um, take part in schooling or uh, you know, school. And uh, that, that seems to the uh, gentleman sitting here in the front row uh, to be really unfortunate. Well, it's complicated. I, 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 I'm saying it as a point to so you know, I, I think this is the darkest time we live in, or, you know, I don't know. But schools are so regimented, so scripted nowadays, and, well, I think and that's so a, stifling, yeah. a kid can't make a move now without mm -hmm. being told exactly mm -hmm. what to do. Everything, the teachers eat either. Nobody, there's no freedom at all. And we, we you know, uh, so I, I take your point. Um, yeah. My, I mentioned John Holt, who yeah. said a conservative is someone who worships a dead radical. Yeah. Uh, uh, I argued with John Holt when he was alive. I can't do it much anymore. Uh, but he, uh, he made a persuasive case in his day for homeschooling as an option. I, I don't see it or sympathize with it. But in some ways, I, uh, you have a point, which is that in some places where schools have become extremely scripted and rigid, uh, in some ways the argument for homeschooling <coughs> gathers some power. Uh, I, I, I met a woman on an airplane once who um, uh, I got to talking to, and she said she was homeschooling her child, 
and I immediately pegged her as a right-wing Christian and, and all my East Coast snobbery sort of went into gear. Uh, and it turned out that far from it, that uh, her son had been in fifth grade the year before and had had this amazing teacher who had the kids do uh, a space project where they all inhabited a space capsule in the classroom for like, uh, they took turns sort of for a day at a time, radioing to the rest <laughs> of the class what was going on. It was an unbelievable sort of, cla but not classic, a novel for once, progressive education project. Uh, and the school board fired him uh, in June, and she pulled her kids out of that school and was homeschooling them. Uh, she would agree with the progressives in this room about what schools should look like and do. And I wonder, I mean, you know, I mean, there are surveys of homeschool people, but, but I think that's the, the rising uh, frustration of people around the country. Uh, well, other... Yeah, you could use this too. A lot of adults that I hear lately um, are talking about sacrificing small work, sacrificing um, certain egalitarian practices for a bottom line that is too serious to ignore. And as a young person, I'd like to hear, I guess, stories that uplift or stories that remind or stories that warn of sacrificing too much for the bottom line. Does that make sense? No, no, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, well, we could have a seminar on this. <laughs> um, it's a very interesting point. Uh, you know, I uh, started by quoting the, the woman who said that, you know, maybe a, a little less Rosa Parks and a little more Scrooge McDuck is better preparation for uh, life in the US uh, right now. And, um, you know, it's a, I don't think so. I mean, I, of course I don't think so, but, but it, it, it does, uh, to me, it, it makes the progressive argument um, all the more important. And it also makes uh, school reform, uh, especially of uh, regular district schools, uh, all the more important. Uh, I do think they've been ratcheted up uh, to, to a degree, to a point where a lot of parents are really alienated. I don't think parents, uh, you know, if we took a nose count or a vote, I don't think uh, progressives would necessarily sweep the day, uh, <laughs> to say the least. But I do think we have a huge uh, overlap now with many people who are not, would never style themselves as progressives. <coughs> Uh, on the issues, on issues like testing, uh, on issues like what an elementary school or a preschool should look like, um, I think there's a, uh, uh, you know, an inchoate, um, but I believe quite large. And, and in fact, there's even some data if you look at uh, what parents say they want uh, from schools. Um, you know, they want. Uh, a rounded education, they want all the subjects, they don't want just uh, math and uh, literacy to be taught, they want the arts, uh, they want PE. Uh, and, you know, I, I mean, I think there's a, there's a way in which um, the, uh, the, the quote, reform, unquote, movement in education uh, uh, has really, um, I don't know, reached a point where uh, a backlash against it is really possible. Uh, I think the the um, the parents in uh, places out west who are uh, starting uh, boycotts, the uh, the parents, the uh, teachers uh, who are starting to say no thanks, uh, public school teachers. 
no thanks to uh, over-testing. Uh, the Texas legislature, one of the houses of the Texas legislature uh, voted um, uh, against the staggering number of uh, tests that they now have. Uh, I think there are straws in this wind. I wouldn't, you know, say it's going to uh, sweep the country, but I do think uh, we have natural allies. We progressives have natural allies now that we might not have had at another time. Yes. I'm glad we settled that. 